Okay, let, let's start with Chauvin, and uh, th- and we'll get into this stuff afterwards. Okay, so the Chauvin trial is finished now, week three. It's, yes. it's week three, where it was the prosecution's expert witnesses. So they had expert well, I mean, witnesses. I guess it's the end of week two from a trial perspective. They've had three other weeks of jury selection. Okay, so yeah, well, the, so the jury selection where they took care of some evidentiary issues. The, the big news of this week were the prosecution's experts. Yes, and yes. Had- so, yeah, week... One was a motion, a motion, a motion, a motion, a motion from the prosecution. And week two was authority, 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 authority. And so I always recommend that that book, uh, Reptile, uh, that they write about how the reptile brain uh, influences and shapes people's decision making. Uh, It was written for uh, one of them was a plaintiff's lawyer uh, written for them, sort of like the behavior panel of emotive analysis for how logic works. Um, in terms of how jury decisions really work, uh, that the unconscious part of our brain dictates our decisions, and we use the conscious part of our brain to rationalize those decisions. And I think the prosecution has done a much better job than the defense at going to those aspects. And that continues. Uh, the week one was all about emotion for the prosecution. Defense was about logic and fact and law. And I think that's the myth of how our legal system operates. It's very rare that a jury actually functions that way. And week two, to me, was really, again, more about authority than it was about evidence. Because on some of the evidentiary grounds, they conflicted with each other. They were weak. There were a lot of problems. So that's the biggest thing I I think people need to appreciate for the week of expert witnesses. They had four expert witnesses, one of which was the actual um, expert who, who performed the autopsy. And well, so for medical experts, and I think it was for use of force experts. Okay, you know, sorry. So I'm on the me- I'm in the medical side right now because the issue that occurred on the medical expert side was that three of the experts had determined one cause of death, which was asphyxia uh, due to a neck constraint, and the autopsy, uh, Doctor Baker, who performed the, the autopsy, actual medical examiner, medical examiner, he, he he did not from the questions that Nelson had asked did not seem to uh, have indicated that cause of death in the actual uh, coroner's report. So no, Exactly. And, and, I mean, it's always a problem for a prosecution when you can't use the state's own medical examiner who conducted the autopsy, who's the real expert in that area, to, to be the lead expert for you. Uh, instead, they brought in three other experts. And one of the problems that we talked about before the trial even started was the concern that the medical professional class as a class, the people who are experts, would, for political reasons, be motivated to uh, be on the state side and not on Chauvin's side. And that became clear early on because several of the state's experts didn't take any money. And uh, to me, uh, that's a bad sign if I was a juror. Now, I don't think these jurors interpret it that way necessarily, but because my question is, okay, hold on a second. You're not getting paid for your opinion. You volunteered, and you volunteered for one particular side before you even saw the evidence. So that tells me that you were really oriented towards a preordained conclusion. The if people think that getting paid causes a problem. For the most part, it does not. Jurors know that, and it just comes with it. To me, it's a bigger problem when you volunteer for free in your first ever criminal case as one of the lead witnesses, Tobin was, um, and, and that tells me, okay, you went in figuring it, looking for an excuse to say, to blame Chauvin for what took place. That means you're even more biased than a regular one. And, and then he proved that later on in some other proceedings. But I look at this in two different ways. One is what, how most jurors react. Most jurors react in what the prosecution was really doing, in my view, was authority. They're saying, look at this big, this person's written a big book. Here's the police chief. They brought in the police chief. Look at these trainers. Look at this big L.A. Uh, uh, off, uh, use of force expert. Look at this big doctor, this big doctor, this big doctor. Um, and that's really what the argument is. It's, it's, it's along the what Reptile talks about. It's emotion first, authority second. Uh, emotion says you got to do something here. And then authority says this is who you have to do it to. And I think that matters often more than the content or substance. But let's say it's a jury that's one of those rare 10 or 20 percent of juries that's really was open minded and is really trying to dig through the facts and come to a conclusion. In that aspect, I think it was not such a great week for the prosecution. Started started off terrible. Uh, their own use of force experts undermined their position repeatedly, especially the ones that came from Minnesota. Um, and then the despite their authoritative declarative statements, which were too strong and too certain and, and direct. 
And then, uh, and then on the medical expert side, though the main expert, one, they're contradicting each other, as you point out. The medical well, well, expert. And just so no one accuses you of misstating it or overstating it, three agreed, but not three agreed, but not with the one who actually performed the autopsy, the dissection, you know, the analysis of the body. So it, yes, exactly. And the so I mean, basically, they went out and found some experts. In this case, they volunteered uh, most of them. Uh, to say what they wanted to say because they're, the state's own medical examiner didn't say it. And that's a problem out of the gate. As a prosecution, you never want to... I've almost never seen a case where they their own medical examiner is contradicting their lead expert. That's just... Especially when their lead expert is so certain. Uh, that creates a problem. I mean, it, and again, the state had to put up the medical examiner because they knew the defense would, would make them look worse. So the, the, the jury hears them. I would have waited to put up the medical examiner next week and concluded on the same message. Instead, they concluded on a message that rebutted their original message. And that original message didn't come with any hedges to it. And so the medical examiner's conclusion was that basically stress. It's what we talked about beforehand. That stress is what killed Floyd in part. Now, one thing that's critical here is they do not have to prove that the sole or but for cause of death was Chauvin. They just have to prove that Chauvin contributed to it. And, and this is one, one of the points of clarification that we need to go over this week. The, so the prosecution does not need to prove that he was the sole cause or even the primary cause, but a contributing cause. That's exactly right. And if they do succeed in proving that Floyd had heart condition, he had drugs in his system, he had had COVID, uh, he had a cardiovascular disease, even notwithstanding all of that, and in fact, notwithstanding, like Rick Hayda said, notwithstanding of whether or not he might have very well died within a half an hour, if Chauvin can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt to have been a contributing cause to a reduction in what would have otherwise been remaining of George Floyd's life, then they succeed in proving the assault. They don't even have to prove that. They just have to prove he contributed to his death. It doesn't matter if even if he changed the time frame. It, it, all they have to do is it, it, it's a substantial factor. Now, it can't be a minor factor. It has to be a substantial factor, but that's it. So the that's why causation is uh, uh, not that. That's why I thought they made a mistake. Uh, the problem with getting these true believers as your experts is that they want to be very certain in areas that are inherently suspect of certainty, and the in a, in a case like this. Um, and similarly, I mean, Dershowitz made the same comment. He said he believed the expert up until the expert started making very de declaratory certain statements. Uh, and then he was like, "Okay, this guy's clearly got a bias." But the other problem is that they they they're trying to prove something. One of our you know lessons or mantras: don't try to prove what you don't have to prove. But that's what they've set out to do. Uh, at least the experts did by saying, "No, no, it can only be this." And frankly, that's when I thought the the prosecutor's act, lead expert Tobin did his most damage to himself by saying, "When you start saying smoking doesn't hurt you, and heart disease couldn't have caused anything or contributed to it even, and the uh, 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 and that." I mean, I think suddenly like 90% of smokers, he said, don't have suffer any problem from smoking. At least that's how it came across. Uh, a lot of people were like, uh, and this was where I made a point on social media, which was that if I was the prosecution on the expert, I wouldn't have them go up and say he's breathing totally fine and he died from inability to breathe. I understand that they have an explanation for that. My point is that, you remember, this is a jury that's no way going to get self-educated or trained in this area of medicine. That ain't happening. So the uh, their ability to understand is going to be pretty basic. And like I said, most of the arguments really from a position of authority. I'm a position of authority. I say guilty. End of story. But in terms of it to, if you're worried about a jury that's actually focused on evidence, I would not make co uh, arguments that contradict common sense and uh, or that sound like they do. Uh, and he did that, I thought, repeatedly. And he didn't need to from an evidentiary perspective. They don't have to prove that heart disease wasn't a factor. They don't have to prove that. They just have to prove that. Uh, that it was a substantial factor, the 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 nature of the neck uh, and body restraint. Yeah. And and if they prove a substantial factor, they get to assault and then they get to felony murder because in yeah. theory, according to Minnesota law, they have proved the underlying felony causing death. Hence, they succeed on the claim. So uh, I'm just going yeah, to bring I mean, up proven intent, obviously, but well, but that just shifts the issue to intent and use of force um, and removes the causation question. Those are the two big issues in the trial. What was Chauvin's intent? Was it, a, a, did he know he was using force so excessively that he was likely to cause substantially bodily harm or, uh, knew he was likely to cause death in the case of the top two counts. 
Um, and, and did he actually cause the death? The other problem with his testimony is something that we predicted before the trial even started. That I said that if they're going to blame the restraint, then my view is that he likely died at the four or five or six minute mark. And that most of the, the length of time he was on him, he was on someone who was dead. Well, Tobin basically said that. Now, what they I don't know if they've thought it through. This is what happens when you have a gung-ho expert who only has a slice of the case, eager to prove his slice of the case, is that means that you know, the like most of the complaints are why didn't he turn him over once he wasn't moving? Why didn't he turn why didn't they provide CPR? Why didn't they provide help when they knew that there was no pulse purportedly? Well, all that happens after Tobin says he was dead. So that can't be a legal factor now under Tobin's own theory. Under Tobin's own theory, it's only what happened while he was still doing things that were physically consistent with resistance. They didn't make sure Tobin's testimony lined up with their use of force testimony. It appears they actually ambushed the defense lawyer and came up with some of the with this breathing explanation in part to well, refute well, the fentanyl uh, the night before. And it's something I brought up a chat which said, uh, how is Chauvin supposed to know of Floyd's heart condition? So that is the eggshell theory, Robert. I'm not mistaken on this, yep. is you take your victim in the state that they come, whether or not you know that they have an eggshell for a skull and it's an actual... You, you still have to have the intent that what you're doing can cause substantial body, serious bodily harm under the manslaughter count. And you still have to establish intent that he thought he was going to kill him in the top two counts. So the his subjective state of mind still matters. It just matters to the intent side, not the causation side. Um, and so it's a two different levels of analysis. The uh, and that's where the I thought it was they, they, they should have, you know, try to rein him in. Uh, the other problem was a lot of his testimony was highly speculative and credit here to uh, the members of the Viva Barnes Law dot locals dot com board. A bunch of them uh, are, are have medical experience uh, and or no or uh, family members that do. And they ish, they responded it, it, because one of the things he said towards the end, because the biggest thing I was curious was not blaming the restraint. I knew that, OK, sure, they're going to find somebody to blame that, but exclude the possibility that fentanyl was the sole cause. Explain why that was. And I thought they would just say it was a cause, but not I didn't know he'd go as far as this guy did. But one of the statements he made that I thought, I'm pretty sure that statement's false, not being a medical expert, but having read some of the medical literature on this and talking to people who are medical experts is he said it couldn't be fentanyl because you have to go into a coma before fentanyl. Now, I think the prosecution was actually being sneaky. Throughout the case, they've often framed the question that if you read the question, the answer is honest, but the, but the answer doesn't mean what it sounds like it means because the question's actually more hedged. So I think they're saying a traditional fentanyl overdose, which usually goes into coma and then death. But my understanding is one of the defense's theories is that this was caused by what they call wooden lung where the muscles around your lung don't work because of fentanyl, uh, and it basically prevents you from being able to get the oxygen you need to breathe. Uh, I thought he would get into why excluding that possibility on direct. He did not. It, it came up only on cross. And the I think the defense lawyer was thrown off, so his cross was not one of his more effective cross-examinations. But his explanation on redirect was, no, if, if it's fentanyl, then uh, the only way you die from, or the way it was interpreted, the, is, is if you go into a coma first. And I was like, not in wooden lung situations because everything I read says rapid death, rapid death. All, uh, the members of our board came in and confirmed that. And, and they said they're also, they, they went through and said there were a bunch of problems with his testimony. And the problem is he's a lung expert. His book is on mechanical ve ventilation of lungs. He's not a forensic expert. This is his first ever criminal trial. As the other experts ended up admitting under cross-examination, if you just look at the medical evidence, just look at the autopsy, then your conclusion would be heart disease or OD. They only were able to conclude something different because yeah. of the videotape. Now, that was the, the woman, I forget her name, but she basically said, yeah, it, looking, looking only at the report itself, not knowing any external factors, not knowing the context of the video, you would have come to the conclusion it was an OD or, or, or heart condition. And but, what that tells you is that they're not really giving medical testimony. They're giving forensic uh, expert testimony. And they're not forensic experts well, other than the medical examiner. It, but it was also their explanation. I, I thought, you know, it was strong and it appeared strong until, you know, it comes in with Dr. Baker where they say it, it would have been, we would have done, we would have classified it as overdose or heart conditions. But, you know, we saw the video. So now we're going to, we're going to change our opinions or modify our opinions a little bit, except Baker comes in and says, you know, uh, Nelson asked him in cross, if it were caused by pressure to the neck or pressure to the back, would you not expect to see bruising or some sort of trauma on the body? 
uh, and did you? And the answer was, I think his answer was, I would expect to, and I didn't. Um, right. That's why he, right out of the gate, he didn't he didn't say there was a, uh, asphyxia. And this was the backstory. What happened was, the reason why this, the county prosecutors cannot be involved in this case is when he gave his initial notes, he even put down, if you brought me in, if you just brought him in without the, me, you tell me the background, I would conclude this was an OD. Uh, they, you know, helped, uh, put it this way, after he met with them, his opinion clarified to blame the stress from the event. Now, there's a lot of problems with that. I intentionally inflicting stress, is that a crime? Because, I mean, by that definition, just handicapping him may, may have caught been enough stress. And, and that, but And also, so all, everyone has to appreciate that this is also within the context of an arrest <clears throat> of an individual who's resisting arrest. Yeah. Where if it were a civilian and this was just people doing this who don't have the authorization to use force, it would be a totally different debate. I'm going to cough here. Hold on a second. And no, it's not anything. I just inhaled some water. Um, so the question is, what I found particularly egregious, and I don't remember what day this was now, is the training expert was asked, do you recognize this method of restraint? And she says, no, don't recognize it, except it's in the manual. So <clears throat> if they're not allowed to use it, what's in the manual, how can they ever put someone under arrest? Now I'm going to cough for another 30 seconds. Hold on. Take it away, Robert, and cover for me. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, on the use of force side, they got taken apart because they made declaratory statements that were just false. They tried to use only one photo image. When you look at all the photo imagery, it's clear that uh, often his knee was on his back, not his neck. But the biggest problem from day one <coughs> on causation, uh, and to some degree intent, was that normally, and the medical examiner sees this all the time when he evaluates it, is... Uh, two major facts. Fact one, there was none of the signs of damage to the ribs, to the rib cage. One of our locals board members pointed this out, whose wife was a doctor, was like, there's huge problems with that guy's, with Tobin's testimony. But is that there was no physical signs at all that the he was having any, diff, uh, there was no external signs that his body had been put under such pressure that he could not breathe. There was no, not even bruising, not even, I mean, basic bruising on shoulder didn't exist. Um, and that was always problem one. That was the medical examiner's problem with saying asphyxia was the causation. The second one is, I mean, they decided to play the data game, which I think it was gonna is gonna backfire on them. They decided to compare. Do you like? They're like, hey, you know, we've pulled people over under DUI who had a higher level of uh, intoxic fentanyl intoxication than uh, than Floyd did. And then they also brought in data that showed they showed in, they showed about six hundred people who had been arrested and still alive mm -hmm. with that level of fentanyl. They also showed about 10,000 people who had died with that level of fentanyl. I, they had some ex explanation for how one was different than the other. And I get it. Again, it's about the prosecution done much better than the defense on this. Visuals, charts, visuals, charts, authority, authority. It often doesn't matter what they're saying. Just look at our current lockdown situation and see how often actual data is irrelevant to policy. Uh, it's just put up a pretty chart. Scary, scary, scary. Got to do all this stuff. Uh, and it's similar it, because it works. Reptile brain, folks. Um, the But if, if they really are digging into the evidence, they, the problem is going to be, the, going back to the second reason why that medical examiner was reluctant to attribute it to it, he himself said he'd never seen a death caused by, uh, by, by being on the back of the neck with no physical injury to the neck that was asphyxia. They'd never, and that's because there are plenty of studies on this. Thousands, I mean, actually they did one in Canada. And they found like 3,000 uh, plus people that were put under severe physical restraint and a lot of bodily force put on a person. They found zero deaths. As I've mentioned, several hundred of them in Minneapolis in the five years prior to this, no deaths. Uh, as I met, as a Minneapolis uh, professor did a big study looking at whether that uh, uh, body weight twice, three times, what they're saying Chauvin did, did not cause any physical uh, serious bodily harm. So that's the problem that they have. And they're just pretending that doesn't exist. Um, and so we'll, we'll see how it works. I mean, I still think that, uh, I thought from an evidentiary perspective, Tobin was an effective expert from a public persuasion perspective, uh, how effective he was with the jury. I'm more skeptical about that because again, I think he's there for authority, not there for the substantive qualities of his testimony. And I mean, I've had trials where my experts were 10 times better than the other side. Didn't matter. Pedigree was 10 times better. Didn't matter. And I've been on the opposite side where I didn't have anywhere near the experts in one. 
because that's not quite how the jury's mind tends to operate that much beyond authority. Defense will have its own experts to say something different. Well, so I was so highlighting, if you're looking at that 10 or 20% jury chance that they're really digging into the evidence, on that side, the defense kept winning. They didn't make as many points with Tobin as they could, but they set them up for closing argument is what they well, did. Now, speaking of which, I want to get back to Cleopatra. First of all, Linda, thank you for very much for the super chat. And Cleopatra, welcome back. Happy birthday, Robert. Gentlemen, how much longer is the trial expected to go on? As soon as I heard the tape, sorry, but I heard the tape where he said, I ate, I can't say it for YouTube reasons, I think. I agree with those who are saying uh, he killed himself. So this is a, it's a classic verbal what you hear one because it's either I ate or I ain't got or I, or I ain't I no, ain't, something like I, that. Yeah. It's it's it was it's the Laurel Laurel Yanny thing. It's it's that's an, it, it. That's it. No. Yeah. But the interesting thing is, a lot of people are asking. First of all, why wasn't there an objection? Because that was leading the witness, or that was a, a suggestive question. But it's in cross examination. Yeah, but you can't leave. It. But so which he, is brilliant, by the way. It's called he, priming. He, Eric Hunley, unstructured podcast. Yeah. It's very well done. He mentioned this. This is classic priming. This is where this is why I recommend people to the behavior panel and to Eric Hunley puts all those people on. Uh, the because it, it teaches you about how the human mind really operates, whether you're dealing with political persuasion, economic persuasion, uh, legal persuasion. The that was genius it, of it was, him. Uh, and, and that was genius the way he did that. For, for anybody who didn't see it, he's he plays the video, asks the guy, What did he say? The guy says, I don't know. I forget who the witness was. Um, says, I don't know. And he says, Does it sound to you like he said, I ate VRUGS? And then he plays it again, and the witness still says, No. But the whole problem is everyone in the jury just heard that. And I tell you, I heard the audio. Like, oh, yeah, that's exactly what that sounds like. And, and, and even if someone is inclined to think they heard I ain't and not I ate, coupled with the evidence which, they, which Nelson was hammering, the semi-chewed pills with the saliva DNA in the back of the car, you know, the da we say the damage is done once they heard the question. My only question was, could the prosecution in theory have objected? And if, I mean, even no. if they could, would the objection have looked guiltier than just letting it slide? No, I mean, it was, it was brilliantly done. I mean, the, the uh, there's no objection. He's just asking, does it sound like this? I mean, it's, there's no grounds to object. I mean, you can lead obviously on cross-examination and, and he, and the way he phrased it, what even a leading question technically yep, it's just, like, does it sound like this? That isn't necessarily yes or no. You, there's other ways you can answer that. The uh, uh, but it was it was it was well done. It was that that was well, yeah, and that was a PR win and probably stuck stuck in the jurors' mind. Um, they probably regret their sequencing. They should have gone emotion, then medical, then use of force. Uh, their use of force experts were weak. They stuck them in the middle. They got exploited. It was an area where Nelson was really well prepared, and they had them saying stuff that just clearly wasn't the case, uh, or was an exaggeration. Um, you know, my view was they should have focused exclusively on the, but you know, it, it, I thought initially they should have focused solely on that. He didn't flip him over when he's supposed to flip him over because there's a lot of, that's where Chauvin is weakest. Uh, instead they tried to say that even putting the knee on the neck was never okay. That's what one of them suggested. Well, that, Two of them that, suggested that. You know I mean? And, and, it, and it, I, I was having a discussion with other lawyers. I said that statement lacks credibility, like yes. it lacks credibility because it's in the manual. So the question is not what was the move approved? The question was, was the move approved for the duration of time for which it was used, given the circumstances when he became unresponsive? And then it's going to be a question of, was the situation a hostile situation enough that, you know, he didn't feel that he could do anything but maintain the position, whatever. And their medical expert blows it all up, says, hey, don't worry about all that. He was already dead. He was already dead early on. He was already dead at the time all the most problematic use of force took place. I don't think they've thought that through entirely. And Just so now, like they hadn't thought through, like Robert Gruler made this point watching the Watchers uh, on YouTube, also as a Locals channel, watching the Watchers .locals he, And he's been doing some of the greatest coverage. I, I tweeted it out as a as a as a serious joke. I'm jogging on the treadmill watching Robert Gruler's assessment so that I can start putting things together. It's great analysis at the end of every. And he day. put up, and by the way, this is why crowdsourcing is useful. Uh, just like our locals board came up with a lot of data and information, I'm probably going to crowdsource for the Rittenhouse case in part using because you get tons of great feedback and information that you just can't come up with all on your own. And one of the things that he pointed out that then showed up in Nelson's cross-examination later in the day, uh, because I think he pointed it out early in social media, so it got back to different people net close to Nelson, was, well, why was he saying if his breathing problems only occurred because of the restraint? and nothing to do with his heart, nothing to do with fentanyl, 
then why was he saying I can't breathe from the time eight minutes before he was being put in the squad car? And it's it's a, it's an interesting thing. So Robert had uh, Robert Grueler pointed that out. Said you know I would have asked the same expert who said you know this was all this was all when the knee started issues. I would have asked him why was he saying I can't breathe in the car before now, anything started. But I can tell I, you why he didn't. Uh, okay, because I mean, when you have a really good expert like that, that's very persuasive on the stand, that you got ambushed with the night before with his key material change in his testimony, you're scared of where that answer could go. Maybe this guy's going to come up with some great answer. That that, And so you figure, I'll just save it for one of the lesser expert witnesses and then have my people on, my people put it up and then make it in closing. It, that's it, likely why he did it. He was clearly thrown off by that expert. I mean, they did a good job. I mean, the, I, I, the way I always put trials, actually somebody else who, who was uh, used to work with me in trials put it this way, there's always going to be blood on the floor in a trial. You just want more of theirs than yours. But anybody who goes in, I had a great uh, Bobby Kennedy, uh, former prosecutor, uh, who said Frank Turkheimer taught evidence at Wisconsin. He said, any anybody who tells you they did a perfect trial from an evidentiary perspective is either an idiot or an ass or both. And I thought, you know, that that's insightful. It's like, you're always going to make mistakes. Just try to minimize the number of them. Well, um, and that's uh, the so I think that's part of it was it, prosecution did a very good job on that side of the aisle. But there were risks. The risks were he made he cut off part of their use of force case. One, he contradicted the medical examiner. Second and third, he made some statements that I think they can have a lot of hay with. I mean, if it turns out there's a bunch of defense experts get up and say, oh, under wooden lung, everybody knows that uh, you're that you don't go into a coma. You just go it's rapid death. Uh, and they have several, and they cite a bunch of learned treatises and the rest on it. Then he looks like a liar because of the way that he presented them. And all of a sudden, they've done in, in that ten or twenty percent chance they're really following the evidence. I thought this week was a bad week for the prosecution. Even their top witness set themselves up in bad ways down the road. And and just on the issue of asking that expert the question himself, I, that was my impression as well. It's you know, the old cliche: don't ask a witness the question you don't know the answer to, because that expert, if he's a smart I don't want to say conniving in a bad way, but if he's a smart expert who's well-prepared, he'll have a good answer. Ask another expert who didn't offer that testimony. And you know, at the very least, the most likely answer is going to be, I don't know, you know, ask him. But at the very least, by asking the question yet again, you ask the question is, why was he complaining about breathing in the car uh, when that expert said, you know, the breathing issues would be only as a result of the pressure? The most probable answer is, I don't know, ask that witness, but you've already planted the seed again, like you did with the, what did you hear in the recording? Um, and incidentally, I mean, you know, I was thinking, had he asked the original expert, the original expert probably would have said he was already in restraints. That's enough to cause, uh, the initial difficulty, which was compounded by the knee. So probably better not to ask the witness who will give you a smart answer. Ask the one who is more likely to not to give you the answer, which brings us to how good a lawyer is Nelson. Robert, uh, you I think he's a classically trained lawyer. So I think, uh, <coughs> he's strong. Where you're taught to be strong, you're taught to be a very good cross examiner. You're taught to focus on the facts and the law, and he does that exceptionally well. I thought the only person who tripped him up was uh, was that one uh, expert, the ma main medical expert, Tobin for the prosecution. I, no one else really has. Then, and he stayed away from problematic witness, stayed away from problematic questions. Uh, brilliant job in that aspect. Uh, I think where he's limited is that a lot of lawyers are taught the mythology of the law, which is it's about facts and evidence and law, when honestly it's not most of the time. Most jurors, reptile brain, uh, it's about emotion, it's about authority, it's about uh, visual. And there he's been very, very limited. So that's where like people are asking me what I thought. I thought if this jury was one of those 10 or 20% of jurors that's just following the evidence, uh, then this is going to be an acquittal jury, at least on the top two counts. If it's, but my view is that's rare. Uh, otherwise, I think it's still fifty percent chance or better of conviction across the board, uh, and at least seventy-five percent chance on manslaughter. But that's because I think after jury selection and opening statement, your case is usually over one way or the other, and the prosecution won on those two sides. Uh, Robert, you probably had a similar experience that I have had with lawyers opposing counsel and the general impression that they give off. I think Nelson is gr is he's doing a great job setting aside. It is absolute David versus Goliath, not from the merits of the case, just from the technicalities of the case. And the it's power on each side, the resources. One, each one side lawyer has. versus a team. 
on the prosecution. About a dozen lawyers, private lawyers, some of the best private lawyers in the country, the entire state, the entire city, the entire media. I mean, he's up again. He has a fair judge, uh, which has given him a, a, an opening, and he's been an exceptionally gifted cross-examiner. And those two things have Chauvin in the game if he has a fair jury. Now, the other possibility is he knows a lot more about that jury than I do. And if it turns out he picked a very good jury and knows that they are a fact-driven jury, not in a, not a normal jury, then uh, then he's very much in the game. Um, what, what I love is, is, is Nelson lo- It's Nelson can play off his image. His image, he looks a bit goofy. Uh, he looks a bit... His ties like, have like a nerd knot, you well, know, they're like, like this, yeah, they're like, like something out of the 1970s. He, he looks like someone who, who you might uh, underestimate, and he looks like someone who always is nice, which makes yes, it much easier yes. for him to very get away. Very good at couching his phrasing, very good at not yeah. getting upset or agitated very often. Very good at frame and and the sequencing of his questions is just brilliant. Uh, that all uh, in that capacity, he's been exceptional. One of the best cross examiners uh, I've seen. Yep. No, I say like it, it allows him to get away with things where you might you might look at him and underestimate him, and also looking at him like he's a, you know a nice puppy dog. He can ask questions of uh, George Floyd's girlfriend, which other people might which might get resentment from other people. So I think oh, yeah. I, I once had I was in a file with a lawyer. I think he knows who he is if he's still uh, watching. An old guy, and he would always, he, everything was always, he would always joke about being old and being forgetful, which, you know, and the judges always laughed, but like the forgetful when you're not forgetting, but playing it off as, oh, I forgot to tell wow. you or give you that. Nobody did that better than Jerry Spence's last <laughs> famous trial. He kept forgetting things he wasn't supposed to say in the trial, and he kept forgetting <laughs> questions he wasn't supposed to raise in the trial. Yeah, like if the if someone believes you, they believe this, you forgot. But if they don't believe you, like you're someone like me, no one would ever believe that I forgot something. They would just call me a liar to my face. So he's playing on his attributes and he's playing. I think he's doing very well. Uh, but I, I just could not imagine what it's like to be in his shoes right now, 24-7, day in, day out. He's got to be on fire against a, a massive team. One thing that people are asking, the difference between a hung jury and an acquittal. And Oh, big. A hung jury, you just you, they get to try him again. So, so now, a hung jury is a jury where they can't get 12 to agree. They declare a mistrial and they get to try them all over again. How It takes only one for a hung jury. Yeah. You know order- what happens is if they're hung, the judge keeps sending them back and sending them back and sending them back, puts massive pressure on that dissenting juror to concede. And it's only if they can't or won't that uh, he declares a mistrial. Okay, but then for an acquittal, does it require all 12? Oh, acquittals, all, yes, acquittal. Uh, no matter what, it, all 12. Acquittal requires all 12. Guilty requires all 12. So the three options are acquittal, conviction, hung jury. Yep. Or the way I would put it is acquittal, conviction, or mistrial. Okay. I may have to change my prediction then. I then, I think I said I was, I, I could see an acquittal on, at the very least, the two biggest charges, but... Uh, I might have to change that. And well, when you have holdouts, I faced that in the Snipes case. Uh, nine of the 12 jurors wanted not guilty across the board. Three held out, and that's why they convicted him of those three little misdemeanors that they thought would have no consequence because of those holdouts. So you often see a compromise verdict when there's a holdout. All right. And now the question was this. Chris Wainwright says, Viva Bonds is the most important podcast on earth right now. Thank you very much. That wasn't my question. My question was, son of a beast thing I forgot. Um, oh, son of a gun. Who, this was it. Sorry. Who chooses the jury foreman? Has a jury, jury. foreman been selected yet? Nope. Doesn't happen until the, uh, they go back in to deliberate. Okay. At the end of the case. And then the jury picks the jury foreman. If the jury foreman is like juror number two, who couldn't wait to be on social media, apparently some juror was being asked about, I think the prosecution is monitoring these jurors because they, they raised the question last week. And then this week they were saying what they thought one of them was talking about a book deal. And it's like, I've never seen, I've, I've never seen it at all. Actually. It's very rare that, that anybody is following the jury uh, during trial. Sometimes they, they follow them and say something after the trial, but very rare during the trial. That also tells me the prosecution is nervous about a couple of jurors. Um, But if it's that juror number two, who was all eager to be on the jury and she's the four person, she'd be the kind of person who would love to be. Uh, then you know Chauvin is done. Uh, if, on the other hand, it's an African American male, then I uh, one of the particularly cert- certain ones that I was following during the jury selection, then he's in the game. So uh, who the jury foreman is, if they come back and ask questions, usually by then we know who the jury foreman is. That can often often be uh, indicative of where the jury is likely going to be heading. Okay. And then the last question that I had on this subject was. 
uh, people are getting confused between reasonable doubt and any doubt. And the well, yeah, kind of. I mean, I, I find that those arguments by prosecutors lame. The uh, uh, so the, the 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 here's the jury instruction in Minnesota. If you have a, a reasonable doubt, is any doubt based on reason or common sense? So the impermissible doubt is doubt that's not based on reason or based on facts that do not relate to the case. So, uh, but I find, you know, any possible doubt, that's what any possible doubt means. It means, you know, metaphysical doubt, things like that, doubt based on things that don't relate to the case. But if you have, as a practical matter, if jurors think somebody's guilty, does anybody really think they say, well, I think he's guilty, but not beyond a reasonable doubt. You're not going to find many jurors who ever think that way. The reality is the, the real evidentiary standard is more likely than not, despite whatever the legal standard is. So uh, reasonable doubt just allows jurors who feel that a person's not guilty to feel more comfortable arguing that point. Uh, that's all it really does. If you, I've studied a lot, a lot of juries, mock juries, focus groups, you name it. And th this has been uh, convincingly proven to me repeatedly. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I always give the uh, Alfred Hitchcock example. So the I think it's either that or it's a Twilight Zone example. Somebody told me once. But uh, I used it in the Snipes case. And after that, uh, prosecutors tried to prohibit me from using it in future cases. They think that somehow was why. And a lot went into that. But, the, uh, uh, but you know, before you point the finger of blame, make sure that the person is uh, may be certain of your accusation lest you put an innocent man in prison is the core of it. Uh, and, and that's all that really means. But the beyond reasonable doubt should matter. Practically speaking, it is very rare. It actually matters in most jury decisions. All right. And uh, coming up for this week now, ha prosecution has finished its evidence or do they still have witnesses left? They still have witnesses left. And I I'm assuming they'll have a few. Uh, I think they still have the toxicologist left and a few others, but I th it's about to shift to the defense. And I, I assume maybe they've wrapped up the use of force, but they they're a little weak on that. So they might try to try to buttress that a little bit. Um, and then it's going to shift to and I don't know if they have any witnesses specific to Chauvin or that day. I don't know if they're going to use any testimony from the other cops or not that, you know, was already recorded or not. So we'll see, but, uh, and then we'll shift to the defense. I think most, most, I do not think Chauvin will testify. Too big about, people are asking, how about the drug dealer? Does the defense call him up? Even if all he's going to do is take the fifth. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Because that's part of their argument. It'll be up to the judge, whether to allow the jury to hear it, they hear him asserting the fifth. Um, but you know, the, in my view, it's pertinent, uh, because it's, it's a, a person's assertion of the fifth cannot be used against them as a defendant. It can be used against other people in a civil or criminal proceeding, uh, depending on the circumstance. So the uh, so to me, it's relevant that uh, and and we predicted that last week said that uh, if that what was likely going to come about. And I, I took some crap from it with some commenters and whatnot uh, that was speculation and what have you. Well, it wasn't speculation for very long. The evidence came out that, uh, you know, the drug dealer was getting rid of drugs, throwing him over the thing uh, that he actually gave that appears that what he gave Floyd looked like an oxy. It looked like oxy, it actually had markings on it as oxy, and it wasn't oxy. It had a bunch of fentanyl and meth in it, um, and so that he was giving him. I think I think it's called a goofball because I thought speedball was with cocaine and the goofballs with with meth, uh, meth and fentanyl. But you know, I, I'm not a drug expert by any stretch. The uh, uh, so uh, there's a story about that, but that's for another day. The uh, uh, but yeah. uh, 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 that'll, that'll be a real hot 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 Robert. That's all I'm gonna say. The, uh, you know, the, uh, if you, <laughs> that's, that's a long story, but so I think given the nature of it, uh, there is evidence that basically, and I think his defense lawyer even admitted it. Basically he could have been charged with reckless murder. They've charged other drug dealers in Minnesota for doing exactly what he did with reckless murder. They deliberately withheld that evidence because it undermined their narrative. So it's going to be another factor. So you not only have causation questions, use of force questions, you now have whether somebody else other than Floyd is responsible for Floyd's death, other than Floyd or Chauvin or those other officers. The drug dealer who gave him something said, you know, you need to help get rid of this. I'm sure that's what happened. That part I'm inferring based on the evidence, but given he was getting rid of other drugs uh, and the, he clearly, uh, well, why do you have a drug that looks like Oxy if you're not trying to mislead people into thinking it's Oxy? No, the, the idea is like the idea that the drug dealer either gave them to him, encouraged him to get rid of them by eating them, which might then explain what people heard in the recording. I mean, that when I say like now, that's a doubt to some extent as to causation. But all of that said, if they nonetheless prove that Chauvin nonetheless contributed, then they still get their conviction of assault for manslaughter. Yes, except for how they've set up their own case. You know, okay. I mean, I mean, in other words, they've they're leading the jury to think it's got to be all or nothing by having that medical expert testify the way he did. 
So that's not what the jury instruction will be, is my understanding. But, you know, they, they, they've put themselves, whenever people do this and try to, the Enron case was lost the moment the moronic de, uh, defense, Petrocelli, that idiot defense lawyer, first ever criminal case, what a criminal case not to be in part of, told the jury, this is not a case of hear no evil, know no evil, see no evil at Enron. There was no evil at Enron. Well, that was never going to be believed. From that moment, he convicted his clients, even though his client most likely was not guilty of the crimes he was convicted of. But that, too, is another story. All right. So that is good for uh, upcoming week. We're going to see where it goes. Uh, there's how much time left in the trial schedule? Two weeks? Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. So, so and we may live stream the closing arguments and give our take on them. That will be very uh, interesting. Right from the courtroom. But that will probably be first week of May is the, is the quickest, is my guess, that we'll get to closing arguments. Thank you.